An army was forming in Picardy in the summertime of 1916. It was an army such as had never been seen before. The war was approaching its second anniversary. The strength of Germany seemed to be unimpaired. Britain's allies, Russia and France, had borne the brunt of the struggle to wrest back from the Germans the advantages which they had won at the opening in 1914. By the end of 1915, France had lost 1,961,687 men, of whom over one million were killed or missing. And now, at Verdun, they were fighting the most ferocious battle yet, launched by the Germans with the set intention that France should bleed to death. It was time for Britain to put forth her strength. The army that was forming in Picardy expressed her absolute resolve to do that. From shattered Ypres in the north, from the flat lands round Luz and La Basse, from the channel ports of debarkation, down the long roads of France, division by division, month by month, the British soldiers flowed forward, like iron filings drawn towards a magnet, the Somme. This was Britain's new army. This was the army with which the war would be fought and won. The old regulars had passed away in the dismal battles of 1915. Many of the first territorials had gone with them. The men of 1916 were the men who had responded to Lord Kitchener's famous appeal. country were not just abstractions. People believed in them. To join up was the thing to do. Those who didn't were shirkers. Women handed them white feathers in the streets. Anyway, all one's friends were going, one would feel out of it. We saw that the Canadians were coming, the Australians were coming, the South Africans were coming. They were catching the first available boat to England before the war was over. If you went to the pictures, there you saw crowds of young men like I was then, drilling in Hyde Park, or it might be crowding round the recruiting office, or it might be, shall we say, a band playing Tipperary. The whole thing was exciting. And even the pulpits, although they started rather shaky at first, eventually they decided to come down on the side of the angels and blessed our Mission. Above all, this was the effort of the British middle class, which had never considered that war was particularly its business until now. But suddenly the fever touched them all. No fear of privation, no obstacles stood in their way. We went to the nearest recruiting office. Uh, none of us knew much about the army. And uh, when we told them our age, uh, the old recruiting sergeant looked very surprised and he said, well, you look the type, you better walk around the park and come back and be 19 years of age. Uh, so we did, and back we went in the afternoon and uh, signed the papers and we were members of the British Army and given a shilling. One idea, it started in Liverpool, caught on at once. Pals battalions, men of the same trade or profession, from the same district, city or street, men of the same class, they liked to stick together to be among the faces they knew. Men of the Northeastern Railway Company formed a battalion. A well-known sportswoman, Mrs. Cunliffe Owen, telegraphed to Lord Kitchener, 
Will you accept complete battalion of upper and middle class men, physically fit, able to shoot and to ride up to the age of 45? The answer came back promptly. Lord Kitchener gratefully accepts complete battalion. This was the 23rd Sportsman's Battalion of the Royal Fusiliers. When the Sheffield City Battalion first formed up on parade, their colonel told them, You're a crowd. A good-looking crowd, but a crowd. It was, said an eyewitness, an unusual crowd. Their ages range from 19 to 35. Standing there as privates were many men whom no other conceivable circumstances would have brought into the army. 500 pounds a year businessmen, stockbrokers, engineers, chemists, metallurgical experts, university and public school men, medical students, journalists, schoolmasters, craftsmen, shop assistants, secretaries, and all sorts of clerks. By the end of 1914, 1,186,337 men had joined the army. By September 1915, the figure was 2,257,521 men. Two and a quarter million volunteers. Fall in A. Fall in B. Fall in every company. Now they were in the army, and they set about learning to be soldiers. Our training was done in the local parks, and uh, for rifles we had broomsticks and whatnot. We went down on the trams from home, met at nine o'clock, went home again for lunch, back again, practically the same as office hours. So our first part of the training, except as it uh, included a lot of marching, which we weren't used to, was more or less uh, something after the style of office workers. They were more than half civilians at this stage, a citizen army in good truth. The manners of civil life clung upon them. A man who was reprimanded for not saluting the adjutant protested, why, I hardly know him. A handful of old soldiers and NCOs, survivors of Mons, South Africa, and forgotten fields of glory, put them through their paces. Sergeant Snell did his bit, Corporal Quilter, in tones. Dress to the right, no other right. Keep those sections of four. Pick those knees up, throw those chests out. Hold those heads up, stop that talking. Keep those chins in. Left, 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 right, left. You planet ball, it's you I've got me glad I on. Go down the left, bump the two. And the old on the left form platoon. If the odd numbers don't mark time to faces, how the hell can the rest form platoon? If he moves in the ranks, take his name. If he moves in the ranks, take his name. You can hear the sergeant major calling. If he moves in the ranks, take his name. So far, we'd been individualists. So far, we'd been Mammy's pet or something like that. Uh, we had a will of our own, and it came rather hard to start with to obey commands. But gradually, we knew how to form fours, right wheel, left wheel, halt, and all the rest of them. Uh, we became, in other words, a disciplined body of men. They learned the rituals of another way of life. They had all the eagerness in the world to impel their learning. Fixing bayonets is one of the wonder most wonderful things in the army. The story goes that the sergeant major was telling the troops how to fix, our, fi fix bayonets, and he said, when I says fix, you don't fix. But when I says bayonets, you whip them out and whop them on. The new armies learned their trade, despite every kind of difficulty, without discouragement. Not only uniforms were in short supply, but tents and huts and blankets and almost every single thing that a soldier needs. There were battalions dressed in uniforms of surplus postman's blue. 
Through a bleak winter, they had little beyond their own high hope and courage to keep them warm. The old soldiers who taught them to drill also taught them other things which were part of the army's way of life. As early as September 1914, people living near Aldershot were astonished and rather shocked to hear a new song on the lips of soldiers route marching along the roads and lanes. When the words of this song were printed in a letter to the Times, slightly amended for the benefit of tender readers, another correspondent quickly wrote, Your correspondent has unconsciously placed a weapon in the hands of the German press. Send out my mother, my sister and my brother, but for goodness sake don't send me. Think how this will read, duly translated into German. Impelled by the passionate will of the nation behind them, a nation still barely acquainted with the meaning of total war, the new armies drew towards readiness. Some regular soldiers frankly despised them. Sir Henry Wilson, a GHQ, for one. Under no circumstances can these mobs take the field for two years. Then what is the use of them? Kitchener's ridiculous and preposterous army of 25 corps is the laughing stock of every soldier in Europe. It took the Germans 40 years of incessant work to make an army of 25 corps with the aid of conscription. It will take us to all eternity to do the same by voluntary effort. Bearing the proud badges of their old and famous regiments, serious, determined, and a little apprehensive, the young soldiers took their departure. In the middle afternoon, the outer parts of the town of embarkation were reached. The band recommenced playing, and at the attention and in excellent step, they passed through the suburbs, the town centre, and so towards the docks. The people of that town did not acclaim them, nor stop about their business, for it was late in the second year. And so to France. The swelling numbers of the British army sufficiently proclaimed that an enterprise of great pith and moment was at hand. 100,000 men in August 1914, 350,000 by January 1915, just over one million by February 1916. Still they came. By June, one and a half million. The people of France took note of their arrival. On the pavements, as they marched by, women in deep black observed them with particular attention. When the British army attained the million mark, the Battle of Verdun was only nine days old. By the end of March, Verdun was 40 days old and had already displayed incomparable savagery. By the end of April, France had been bleeding to death for 70 days. In June, new heights of ferocity were reached, and a hundred days of Verdun had passed by. The French people looked thoughtfully at the young British soldiers. The French government and their generals looked towards the new British commander-in-chief, Sir Douglas Haig. When Haig was appointed, he told Joffre's liaison officer, I pointed out that I am not under General Joffre's orders, but that would make no difference as my intention was to do my utmost to carry out General Joffre's wishes as if they were orders. It had already been decided in 1915 that the Allies should shape their 1916 strategy as a joint, simultaneous effort, a gigantic pressure from all fronts at once against the Central Powers. 
There had never been any doubts that the British Army would take part in a massive offensive in 1916. But now, week by week, month by month, as Verdun dragged on, the project assumed a new significance. It was not so much now a matter of smashing Germany, it was becoming a question of saving France. Haig's dilemma was acute. At the end of March, he told Lord Kitchener, I've not got an army in France, really, but a collection of divisions untrained for the field. The actual fighting army will be evolved from them. For these reasons, says Haig, I desired to postpone my attack as long as possible. Haig was fighting for time. Then, on May the 24th, Joffre's liaison officer told him, Owing to the great losses of the French at Verdun, which would soon reach 200,000, General Joff was of the opinion that the offensive cannot be delayed beyond the beginning of July. Two days later, Joffre came in person to hammer the point home. The French had supported for three months alone the whole weight of the German attack at Verdun. If this went on, the French army would be ruined. He therefore was of the opinion that the 1st of July was the latest date for the combined offensive of the British and French. I said that before fixing the date, I would like to indicate the state of preparedness of the British Army on certain dates and compare its condition. I took 1st and 15th July and 1st and 15th August. The moment I mentioned August the 15th, Joff at once got very excited and shouted, the French army would cease to exist if we did nothing till then. Haig agreed to attack on July the 1st, accepting that his army would be unready. The place was known, the Somme, where the British and French armies met. The date was fixed, July the 1st. The tempo of preparation accelerated. There were 35 days to go. The new steel helmets were issued and dubiously received. One million had been delivered in France by July. We've all been served out with a new shrapnel helmet. Now we look like so many Tweedledees. The tin hats are about the limit in ugliness. Just like an inverted dish cover or tin basin. When it comes to wearing them, they're about as uncomfortable as they can be. For all these newcomers in their new world across the water, it was time to learn the disciplines of wars. As the strange hardships and novelties of its trade presented themselves, the citizen army rearranged its thoughts. These were situations beyond what they had expected, beyond the ordinary range of communication. They devised new forms of words and set them to old tunes. A war of life, a war of life. Living in a trench, a war life, a war life, fighting for the French. We haven't got a wife for a nice little wench. We're all quite happy in an old French trench. Dear Auntie, this leaves me in the pink. We are at present wading in blood up to our necks. Send me fags and a life belt. Satisfying jokes were devised along these lines. Dear mother, this war's a bugger. Sell the pig and buy me out. John. Dear John, pig's gone. Soldier on. care of the feet, after marching, or more likely after long continuous hours in the clammy slime of the trenches, was obligatory, an officer's task to attend to it. Sanitation and hygiene were matters for serious observance, as far as possible. He was carrying two full latrine buckets. I said, uh, hello Evan, uh, you've got a pretty bloody job. He said, 
Bloody job, bloody job indeed. The army of our Tuxuk Seas was utterly destroyed for lack of sanitation. Rations claimed the continuous attention of all ranks and inspired their muses. Oh, hell, what bloody big lumps of beef! Oh, hell, what bloody big lumps of beef! Oh, hell, what bloody big lumps of beef! Bloody big lumps, bloody big lumps, bloody big lumps! Fresh meat, generally, was for out of the line. In the line, it came in tins, with vegetables mixed. The famous product of McConaughey. Oh, a little bit of everything, got in a tin one day, and they packed it up and sealed it in a most mysterious way. And some brass that came and tasted it, and won my senses in. And all the time, training for the imminent battle continued. The moment was approaching. There was much to do. Now, in 1916, the British Army gained familiarity with the worst of its afflictions. When you came out of the line, you were mentally tired, but you were also physically tired and you hoped you were going to get a rest. But you usually did not get much of a physical rest because almost every night you had to go on working parties up to the front line, of which the great secret was that for the last mile everything had to be carried by hand. And somehow or other, you had to get up to the front in silence and in darkness, uh, food and ammunition, drinking water, trench mortar ammunition, um, duckboard uh, planks to make dugouts with, posts, and worst of all, coils of barbed wire. This was a manpower war. The labor was unending, fatigue never absent. It played havoc with training programs. It made nonsense of periods of rest. It was rather appalling, really, to see some of these chaps laying down asleep after they'd come out the line after four or five days, fatigued, beat to the world. They hadn't been laying down three or four hours scratching theirself <laughs> when a sergeant would come along and say I want you, I want you, I want you fatigue, falling outside Nobody knows how tired we are Tired we are Tired we are Nobody knows how tired we are And nobody Waiting, waiting, always bloody well waiting to go up to the line, to come out of the line for rations, for orders, for a traffic block hours old to clear on the line of march. And what an extraordinary thing it was. Whenever you were really stuck and getting to the end of your tether, it was always raining. Soldiers waited, the staff prepared, prepared the largest British army ever yet seen for the time of testing. One and a half million men, four separate armies, 18 army corps, 58 divisions. The mere administration of such a host was a major enterprise. Staff officers, like soldiers, had everything to learn. One of them wrote, Nearly every one of the ramifications of civil life has its counterpart. Food supply, road and rail transport, law and order, engineering, medical work, the church, education, postal service, even agriculture. 
and for a population bigger than any single unit of control except London in England. Can you imagine what it is to feed, administer, move about, look after the medical and spiritual requirements of a million men? Civilian experts were crammed into uniform and turned into staff officers. Eyebrows were raised. Some regular army people were scandalized. Haig welcomed the experts and remarked, These critics seem to fail to realize the size of this army and the amount of work which an army requires of a civilian nature. The working of the railways, the upkeep of the roads, even the baking of bread and a thousand other industries go on in war as well as in peace. So with the whole nation at war, our object should be to employ men on the same work in war as they are accustomed to do in peace. To put soldiers who have no practical experience of these matters into such positions, merely because they are generals and colonels, must result in utter failure. The hundredth day of Verdun came and went. The assembly of the British Army was nearing completion. Only three weeks to go now. The Royal Flying Corps expanded to 27 squadrons. In May, they began to win air superiority over the Germans. Then their real work began, spotting for the artillery with fresh refinements of aerial photography and recognition. There was no mistaking the difficulty of the task ahead. Hay wrote, The enemy's position was of a very formidable character. During nearly two years' preparation, he'd spared no pains to render these defences impregnable. The first and second lines each consisted of deep trenches, well provided with bomb-proof shelters and with numerous communication trenches connecting them. The front of each line was protected by wire entanglements, many of them in belts 40 yards broad, built of iron stakes interlaced with barbed wire, often almost as thick as a man's finger. The numerous woods and villages in and between these systems of defense had been turned into veritable fortresses. In the early summer of 1916, the project didn't look impossible. Swelling numbers and a sense of new power gave the army confidence. In this war of guns, at last, British production was approaching the army's needs. In July, there were 4,338 British guns in France, nearly a thousand of them heavies. The munitions programs were at last bearing fruit, and the shells poured in. Vast dumps appeared by the roadside and vanished again under camouflage. The depot at Rouen alone handled 3,500 tons a day. Endless lines of lorries supplied the hungry front. Over 400,000 horses and mules also pulled and carried for the army. Light railways pushed forward to the front line itself. The variety of articles was astonishing, the quantity unbelievable. One base alone issued in 1916, 11,000 compasses, 7,000 watches, 12,800 bicycles, 40,000 electric torches, one and a half million waterproof sheets, five million anti-gas helmets, two and a quarter million bars of soap. This was becoming a war of objects and machines, the material battle, the Germans called it. 
The authority of the machines grew from day to day. The personality of the individual human being withered among the million masses and in servitude to the weapons of modern war. These are our masters. The slim, grim muzzles that irk in the pit. The chafe for the rushing of wheels, for the teams plunging madly to bit as the gunners swing down to unkey, for the trails sweeping half-circle right, for the six breech blocks clashing as one to a target viewed clear on the sight. For the hour of the red battle harvest, the dream of the slaves of the gun. June the 24th, the 125th day of the Battle of Verdun. One week to go. We are the guns, and ye serve us. Dare ye grow weary, steadfast at night time and noon time, or waking when dawn winds blow dreary over the fields and the flats and the reeds of the barrier water to wait on the hour of our choosing the minute decided for slaughter. Swift the clock runs, yea, to the ultimate settlement. Stand to your guns. Yesterday, our intense, ceaseless artillery bombardment of the German positions by pieces of all calibers commenced to pave the way for the approaching assault. In the afternoon, I rode to a small crest to watch it. At times, the village of Posier, two miles beyond our front trenches, was being completely smothered in shells, while in their turn, Thiepval, Cantalmaison and Fricois were subjected to the hurricane. Endless columns moved up along the roads and tracks of Picardy. They moved out of the world of everyday things, out of the orbit of anticipation or ordinary apprehension, into a world riven by unspeakable sound. General Rawlinson, the 4th Army commander, 
wrote in his diary, what the actual results will be, no one can foretell. But I feel pretty confident of success myself. Though we shall only get it after heavy fighting. We've done all we can, and the rest is in the hands of the good God. infantry, each man bearing 66 pounds of assorted equipment, took up their final positions, awaited the last violent spasm of the gun. Across the evening, homing birds cawed on high above them waiting, and the preparation there. And some people began settling down for the night. The more solicitous disposed themselves in groups and stood about, and rather tended to speak in undertones as though to not hasten or not disturb, to not activate too soon the immense potential empoweredness and talk about impending dooms. It fair gets you in the guts. Let them keep on now and take their rest. 